Sisters. I'm Sandhya. And I'm Swapna. And this is the STEAM League, where we get to learn about the amazing careers, aspirations, and day-to-day -day lives of incredible superheroes in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And today, we're really excited because we get the honor of being joined by Brandon Walker. Mm -hmm. So Brandon is a hydrologist studying in the Canadian Arctic and a research associate at Wilfrid Laurier, Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. He's also the manager of the Trail Valley Creek Research Station. Cool beans. Mm -hmm. All right. So welcome to the Steam League, Brandon. It's really nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. Thanks for having me. So I see you've got the hat ready here. I do. <laughs> um, we're going to have a lot of puns in this, Brandon. Um, so <laughs> no more waiting. We're going to get right into a quick game. Yes. And it's going to be the quick fire. And we're going to be taking questions out of this handy dandy tube here. So your first question, Brandon, is what's the most important skill that you use in your job? I would say scheduling is the most important, like good time management skills, good organization. What's your favorite holiday? Ooh, probably Christmas. Mine too. Me too. And we're shooting this in July, so Christmas in July is definitely something we're going to be doing. Yeah. yeah. It's my favorite just because of the season, with the snow, winter, winter season's the best. Yeah. Same. It's snow much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Which one do you prefer? And I think I know the answer. Negative 40 degrees or plus 40 degrees? Negative 40 any day. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. What was your favorite subject in school? Ooh, geography. It doesn't really kick off until after high school though, so. You gotta stick with it, and then it becomes real interesting. <laughs> Pro tang in there, kids. <laughs> and what's your favorite Arctic animal? Probably, I'm gonna go with something like a raven. Ooh. Like, yeah, they're big, they're everywhere, they're really smart, and they're, they're not the typical Arctic uh, lovable creature like a polar bear. Okay, your next quick fire question is, who would you share a brunch with if you could choose from history? One of the early Arctic or Antarctic explorers. Ooh. I think they would have pretty cool stories to share that, that would be similar to stuff that I've experienced, but of course our experiences are a little bit more tame than theirs. And I think they'd have some uh, interesting observations to share. So someone like Shackleton or something like that would be really cool. What's your favorite type of precipitation? Uh, definitely snowfall. Um, I don't know, in the north when it's really, really cold and uh, you get this like ice fog that shows up. So it's not actually you know, snowing, but it's snow crystals in the air and the sky is glittering. Um, that's probably the coolest. You know, wow. so like a, a nice minus 40 ice fog day where the everything looks like glitter is probably the coolest. That sounds incredible. Ice fog, I can't say that I've experienced ice fog yeah. yet. Wow. That is pretty phenomenal. Okay. Oh, I have a quick question. Um, what is a royal person's favorite type of precipitation? I don't know. What could it be? Rain. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a good one. I remember that. Yeah, my future children roll their eyes at that one very hard. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, and there's more where that came from. Okay, your next quick fire question is, what would your superpower be? I don't know, I think it'd be really cool to have a superpower like Frozone from The Incredibles to control snow and ice, or like, like Storm from X-Men. But maybe I'm a little biased there because that's what I study. Hey. I think that'd be a pretty cool superpower. Totally agree. Being able to control yeah. would be pretty snappy. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so Brandon, what's your favorite food? I really like dill pickles. <laughs> Me too. 
any, any day of the week, any time, you can't be a good dill pickle. Okay, so your last quick bar question, what's your favorite city? Oh, that's a hard one. You know, I'm, I've traveled the north a lot. I love the outdoors and anything to do with mountains and lakes and rivers. So I would probably say Whitehorse is, is my favorite city, but I might get a lot of flack for that. Why? So, Oh, just friends all over the north would be a little jealous to hear that and uh, you know my hometown's Waterloo Ontario so it's it's almost the entire opposite of, of Whitehorse and anything out west so anywhere you can be near the mountains the rivers and the ski hills and you can do all of those in one day is, is probably my favorite Okay, we uh, have to really agree with you there. We've been to Whitehorse just for a small amount of time and Super it lucky. was amazing. The mountains, yeah. the everything, the people, everything. Yeah, a great place. Any time of the year too. So next, we're going to explore some of the who, what, where, when, why, and how of Brandon Walker's career and everything that he does with some career questions. Oh, it's the summer though, so I don't know how long I can last with the two gone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Crazy connect too. Okay. Okay. So, Brandon, you're a hydrologist and your work relates to the Canadian York. Can you tell us exactly what you do? Yeah, so I study how water is changing in the north with, with the, the changing climate. So we look at all aspects of the hydrology. So we're looking at water, whether it's in lakes and rivers or stored frozen in the permafrost or falling as snow and rain. We kind of look at how all of those things have changed and, and hopefully predict how they will change with further climate warming. Because in the Western Arctic where we work, climate change is, you know, the, the temperatures have increased double the rate of the global average. And so over even just my lifetime, there's been significant changes in the temperature and, and that's changing precipitation patterns. So we kind of want to know how, how are they related and then how will they affect other, you know, downstream things like the vegetation, the wildlife, the communities. So we're kind of looking at how the physical aspect in the water is changing to inform, you know, other scientists to, to help guide their studies. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of collaboration with the results of what you find, because climate change affects pretty much everything, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. And, and we work with a lot of, uh, you know, a large diverse group. We, there's social scientists, there's people who study specific types of plants and wildlife. You know, we even work with different groups from uh, all over the world who study, you know, a very particular aspect of a part of the hydrology. And we all sort of communicate and relate our results and build off each other to, to get a better understanding of the larger picture. Really good way of describing it. Yeah, it's multi and interdisciplinary mm -hmm. and it's such a, an important topic for everyone. Yeah, yeah, it is. It affects everyone whether you're there or not. Just because you don't live there doesn't mean it's not going to affect you in the long run. Yeah, exactly. Who doesn't rely on water? No one. Yeah. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> everybody. Luckily in Canada, we have an abundance of it. But just because we have a lot of it doesn't mean it's easily accessible to everybody and doesn't mean it might not be an issue in the future. Too true. Yeah. See, so your next question is, what steps does one have to take to become a hydrologist and where in the world do hydrologists generally work? Hydrologists work everywhere. Every, you know, other, every country, every field of earth sciences is in one way or another typically related to hydrology, whether it's engineering, or water resource management. Water is a big part of everything. It's what makes life unique on this planet, right? So without without water, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, but so, so the steps that I took, so I have a background in geography. I really liked earth sciences and it was, you know, geography is a pretty diverse field. It covers a lot of different subject matter and I just, found it interesting and every year I would take courses and the hydrology ones really fascinated me. Any day you get to be out in a river for school or for work, you know, you're out in nature, the water is rushing past your boots, there's birds and fish and and you're with good company. It's it's a 
a great day. So that just sort of intrigued me. And it's like, well, how do you, how do I make this a career? How do I, how do I keep doing this for a living? And so I got into research and now I get to do what I love full time. So it's not, not much work when you enjoy what you do. It's amazing. And it sounds like there's lots of different applications for hydrology as well. So that's pretty Yeah, I know, I know people who do similar work to me, but they work for a city doing water management or they work for a large organization like NASA predicting weather or, or NOAA predicting weather. Um, so yeah, it's a very diverse field and, and there's lots of opportunities, especially within STEAM fields for this type of work. So your next question is, what has been some of the most interesting or surprising research findings that you've had so far that you can share? And how might that shape questions that you will be investigating in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've been lucky enough to be monitoring the Arctic sites that we have for about 40, almost 40 years now. So we have a pretty long term record, which is unique for remote northern locations. And and with that data, we're able to see trends, especially in, in temperature, where the temperatures, the average temperatures where we're working in the Western Arctic have increased upwards of five degrees over, you know, for the five decade period. So you're looking at really drastic um, increases in air temperature and that changes things like the snow cover season. So we're seeing a shorter snow cover season, earlier spring melt, which has implications for downstream flooding events and you know, community travel and things like the ice road accessibility. Um, so it, it affects more than just the climate. It's, it's affecting economics in, in these regions as well um, this, but so with this change in temperature we kind of look at more specific things like how you know how is the timing of the snow melt changing on a very very small scale and how might we be able to learn take what we learn you know in in your backyard study area and apply that to something larger. So a lot a lot of the things we're seeing are driven by this changing temperature and and a really large unknown is how things like, like CO2 being stored in the permafrost is going to affect our future climate because the permafrost where we are is thawing very rapidly driven by these warming temperatures and the permafrost stores a very large amount of CO2 which is the, one of the dominant greenhouse gases so if we thaw more soil we're releasing CO2, which might cause a negative feedback cycle where the climate warms and it continues to warm and it spirals out of control. So one of the projects our group has been focused on lately is how does the permafrost thaw affect things like CO2 and methane emissions and, and how is our site different from other sites and how how might they affect you know a larger regional area it's fascinating because that has a lot of real life applications that directly affect everyone so that's really really cool so i was wondering what are some of the tools that you use in your job both in the field when you're in the north and beyond we use a lot of um really neat modern you know, futuristic tools to measure all different aspects of the snow. So my specialty was using drones um, to map and measure snow and water across landscapes. So we would use a drone similar to how in the past we would use an airplane or a satellite and we can map things like snow cover and the, the depth of the snow. So you get to use a lot of really cool, what we call remote sensing products. So you're, you're measuring things remotely. So that includes your drones, your airplanes, your satellites. Um, and so we get to actually combine what we see on in the ground on the field in a very very small spot um, to what you know we can map and estimate at a very larger scale. So sort of able to bridge gaps between what you see with your eyes when you're at a site and what you could see if you could step back and take a big large picture. We also use a lot of automated weather stations. That's the primary way that we collect a lot of our data. So. They're similar to the same weather station you would look at on your, you know, your phone app. Just ours are remote and built for extreme environments. 
um, and they're typically only visited a couple times a year, so they have to be able to run on solar year-round, which is hard in the Arctic winter because it's 24-hour darkness and the temperatures are very cold and it's snowing all the time, so it, it uh, definitely provides a challenge. But we also get to use a lot of really new tools to look at things like greenhouse gases. So we have towers that have sensors that use lasers to measure things like CO2 and water fluxes and methane. And we have um, these really neat little greenhouse clamshell looking things that we call auto chambers. And it's, so it's like, a, it's like a clear greenhouse that opens and closes on a schedule and it sucks the air from, from the, the little clamshell to look at, you know, how the plants and the soil are either absorbing or emitting things like water vapor and CO2 and methane. Um, so those are some of the main tools that we get to use, which is, which is really neat. And it's, the technology changes so fast, so you're always on your toes. You're always trying to keep up with what's new, which is a, a large challenge, but it's sort of part of the fun. You're, you're always learning something new. Yeah, that's super cool. And what's your favorite tool? I would, I would say, so this isn't actually a tool, but I would say my favorite tool for Arctic winter field work is a snowmobile. Uh, it's totally <laughs> so it's, not, it's not a specific tool, but it, it's the most important transportation tool while you're up there. And then, you know, something flashy like a, a drone is, is always, it's always fun. Cool. Uh, the, all of these tools sound like so much fun. And how do, or what are the main adaptations that these tools need to work in extreme conditions like extreme cold? Yeah, so a lot of things are not meant to work in minus 40. Um, <laughs> so it's always a constant maintenance challenge to keep things running. A lot of the things that we'll use are either insulated to keep some of the electronics warm or they're, they're made specifically for extreme environments. A lot of the times you just have to rely on good old simple tools like a, a meter stick ruler or, or your skis or you know like a, an avalanche probe to measure snow depth because it's pretty hard for those to go wrong. Whereas some of these fancy electronic tools work in a laboratory and then you get it to the field and they, they don't work. So that's always a constant challenge is just trying to keep things working and keep them moving and and uh and not breaking on you <laughs> sounds like you have to be really flexible and adaptable in that field in the field yeah your plan a is almost never going to work so <laughs> you have to start planning like c d e and then that's when things actually you know come together so yeah yeah you have to be very flexible and and uh and patient mm -hmm. Definitely. And you work on the Trail Valley Creek Research Site. Tell us what this is and why it's so important. Yeah, so we're fortunate to have a research station which basically just consists of some all-weather all tents in the middle of the tundra um, with a, you know off-grid power system and, and sleeping quarters and accommodations for researchers. Um, but this is really neat because it lets us use the field sites that we that we frequent as sort of what we call living laboratories. So we're actually able to you know live on site, and you can monitor things daily or hourly if you need to, um, and that way you don't have to rely on making artificial conditions back home in a lab somewhere. You you can actually live next to the things that you're studying, which is really convenient, and it's sort of how a lot of you know, physical earth science projects are undertaken. Um, so we have this research station that is used internationally. So we have, you know, academic research groups and government research groups coming from all over the world, including ourselves at Wilfrid Laurier University. We're the main users of it. Um, but we, you know, are able to host all these different collaborators, which only helps further our research and, and build on theirs as well too. So we have this really unique, um, awesome sort of focus study area where a lot of people are doing work. And there's a, there's a fair amount of these types of stations across, you know, the Canadian and 
Canadian Arctic and Alaska, but um, there's still only a handful of them. And so there's a lot of spatial data gaps across the north because these areas are complicated and hard to get to and, and the logistics of it is complicated. So it, it is nice having this permanent station that we can frequent. And you've even been able to apply some of your skills from other areas of life, I think, especially earlier on with this project in helping to build some of the platforms. We were tasked with rebuilding this research station. And I was in my undergrad. I had a background in landscape and construction. Um, so I was actually able to take charge and we built decks in the middle of the Arctic by helicopter, <laughs> which was the coolest trip ever. Um, and uh, yeah, and then things just progressed from there and I eventually took, you know, started building more and more of it and then sort of took a management role in, in coordinating all the logistics and, and setting up the infrastructure there. So it's, it's really neat. I have a connection to it. It's like a home away from home. Because and so did you end up doing, did you end up doing any um, building as a kid or anything that you then applied to this? Yeah, we were, we were always out building tree forts or bike jumps and stuff like that. My my father had a framing business actually, so he built houses for a living. And I remember growing up and I just, I knew I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that for a living. I didn't want to work outside. I didn't want to, you know, have to work in these really, on those really crappy weather days to, you know, to get the job done. And it's kind of ironic because here I am building stuff with my hands in the worst possible conditions yeah, that's yeah. really, really interesting that you still get to apply some of the skills that you learned and saw as a kid to what you're doing in your career today. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very grateful for it and, and I'm always learning and, and those skills that I've learned for my job and for the field work that I do have even transferred back into my you know, personal life. I've had to learn how to be an electrician for field work. So that translates into doing house renos and I've had to learn how to be a on the fly mechanic when things break down and that's transferred back into my real life as well too. So it's, it's uh, highlighted some passions and hobbies that I didn't even know I had. <laughs> that's really, really awesome. So everyone out there, whatever passion or hobby you have, you never know, it might turn into a career or be useful for your career. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so before we snowball any further with this flurry of questions, we're going to pivot a little bit and switch to a quick game called Explain This Photo. Mm -hmm. We went on your Instagram, Brandon, and we found a couple <laughs> of photos. <laughs> so we're going to ask you to explain. The They're great of. photos. They're really exciting. So this is the first one. What is this photo? Well, I guess it's three photos in one. Yeah. Okay, so the, so the top portion of that is a picture of our Trail Valley Creek Research Station in the winter. So if you see those uh, orange and white, you know, tents that look like barrels on their side, those are what we call Weather Haven tents. So those are our all season insulated tents for our camp. Then if you see the little orange dots on the side of that photo, those are our sleeping tents. So we sleep outside in the winter in just a four season regular camping tent with a really good sleeping bag. And you can actually see the snow drifting and covering most of those tents. Um, so it's a constant battle to dig yourself out of your tent or else you become entombed. Uh, the bottom photos are some examples of some of our field research. So the one on the, on my left is a really high precision GPS system that we use to measure um, things like elevation of the snow or the ground with, with centimeter accuracy. So we can come back to a site every year and measure, you know, say the height of the ground and see if it's lowered or raised. We can measure snow depth with those. And we actually use it a lot for the drone work that we do. And then the kind of blurry photo on the right is a picture of a snow crystal through a microscope. Um, I don't know what I was thinking when I posted it because it's not a good example of, of any snowflake <laughs> or any particular snow grain, but it's probably a picture of what we call depth hoar. So 
in the north where we are, the snow is actually very shallow. We don't we don't get a lot of snow, um, and the temperatures in the air are so cold. You know, minus 30, minus 40, and snow being a, a good insulator, the deeper it gets, can either insulate the soil or you can have water move from the ground through the snowpack into the atmosphere with temperature gradients. So you get these really cool snowflakes develop that actually look like upside down prisms. And we call that depth hoar or sugar snow and it's very loose and it's almost like like sand. You know, it's 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 doesn't um, like aggregate or, or doesn't coalesce very well. So it's very loose. And if you're if you've ever been snowmobiling in the north and you get stuck in like a you know a, a shrub bush and you try to dig yourself out and the snow just keeps piling in, you're probably very familiar with that type of snow. Cool. Wow, that it was a three in one and that was super yeah, that was a long explanation. <laughs> I love the I love the close up of the, the snow. Sugar snow, I never heard of that before. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, here's the next one, Brandon. Tell us what this is about. All right, so that is a sort of an overview of the typical gear that I would bring with me on any given day in the field. So I've laid out all of the equipment, you know, my winter jacket, snow pants, insulated hats, ski, ski goggles, which are very, very important, especially because when you're there in the spring, um, you're nearing 24 hour daylight and you're working out on the snow cover so the snow reflects all that radiation back in you and you get wicked sunburns like you wouldn't believe um so what i should have included in that photo is a big bottle of sunscreen um but and then the other stuff uh sort of on the side is a little bit more of the technical gear that we bring in the field so there's a picture of a drone that type we would actually usually just use for you know, videos or documenting what we're doing in the field and then there's some spare battery packs there because batteries don't last very long in the cold. And there's some emergency communication devices there too. Because we're so remote and off-grid, we have you know, a, a series of emergency protocols to contact the nearest hospital if something were to go wrong. Because we are working in a pretty high risk area with you know no connection to the outside world. So if something happens when you're out in the tundra in the winter, you need to be able to call for help. And then uh, what else is in there? Oh, and then there's just a toolkit that I have to bring everywhere with me because every time you visit a site, there's probably something mechanical wrong with it. And you need to, while you're there, you know, diagnose the problem and try to fix it while you're there. And a lot of the times you have to MacGyver stuff because you don't have access to the proper tools that you need to fix it or the proper parts that you need. So you have to get real creative and work on the fly. I think one of the things you said there about sunscreen, I think a lot of us associate sunscreen with the summer. So it's kind of cool to think about, hey, you kind of really need it in this context too. Yeah, every time I come back from the field, I look like a raccoon because I've been wearing ski goggles for a month straight. And all that shows is just this little strip you know, of, of really sunburnt, crispy skin. And then the backs of your hands too are, are just completely fried. And then everything else is just pasty. <laughs> Hasn't seen the sunlight in, in months. So yeah, very important to have sunscreen. Mm -hmm. Safety first, all season. Okay, the last photo that we're gonna ask you about is, oh, this is the top, this one. Oh, I I think that's a, uh, is that pizza? It looks like pizza. <laughs> yeah, so we, we've we been upgrading our culinary experiences at our research station and having so many different people come through, we sort of started compiling recipes to you know, try to spice things up a little bit. So everybody thinks we go to the North and just eat sitting on a chair you know, eat a bowl of oatmeal a day and like a pack of beef jerky and you suffer through it and that's field work. But we're actually pretty glamorous now. It's it's more of a glamping experience, hence the homemade pizza from scratch. <laughs> Love it. It looks very delicious. It does. And I think the caption was best pizza in the north or something of the type and uh, look like it. Yeah. yeah, you have to get real creative. If I can remember that picture, there's probably some 
weird a weird combination of ingredients like like pineapple and canned ham and things you have to get creative but uh it was delicious and if you haven't had pizza in weeks it just tastes that much better oh yeah. love that and hey that combination sounds like a hawaiian pizza so why not <laughs> yeah. yeah that's what we we're going for <laughs> Okay, with no further ado, we've got a few more career questions for you. Okay, the first one is, you sometimes work in very difficult weather conditions, and you've talked a little bit about that. What's the most challenging situation that you've been in, and how did you manage it? Okay, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of stories, um, but a typical, I don't know, I guess a, a typical one would be you're out visiting some far sites that are, you know, many kilometers away from your, your the camp base station. And you're out with a couple other colleagues. You're all traveling on snowmobile across the land. There's not much, you know, not too many landmarks. It's pretty untouched terrain. And it, it's, a, it's a very common situation where something goes wrong, like either someone loses a GPS. We've had that many times. Um, somebody's snowmobile breaks down or all the snowmobiles break down that's a pretty common one too or you run out of gas um, or we've even had it where you're out visiting some far sites and a combination of many of those things will happen along with a blizzard at the same time so you'd be full whiteout conditions you can't see your hand in front of your face you have no idea where you are and somebody's snowmobile won't start and those moments kind of make you panic a little bit. <laughs> um, but luckily, we all have some forms of um, either you know, professional or practical training and you know things like first aid. So you know everybody's more or less covered on that front. And, and typically, you have a couple of people who are very hands-on and handy and good problem solvers. So you know if, if your snowmobile won't start, you could you, you can either fix it or try to fix it or, or come up with a solution. But when you have a, a blizzard, there's really nothing you can do. So th the main thing that we've sort of learned over the years is just understanding and mitigating all the risks. So those things don't happen because it's a very common and sad story. Um, like every year somebody gets stuck in those situations and they don't come back from it. Like they're never seen again. So it's, it's real and it can happen, but as long as you understand those risks and are ready to say no or change your plans, uh, that's, that's great. So we've, we've been out and there's, you know, a full whiteout blizzard and you can't see your snowmobile tracks to even get back to where you were. And so you maybe just wait it out, you know, dig a hole in the snow and, and just hide out for an hour or so and let the, let the winds die down a bit or, or, uh, use you know like a, use your gps and try to navigate blindly back and it, it's always worked out great for us we've been very lucky which which is great because <laughs> the, the consequences could be severe but luckily on on my watch we've had nobody get seriously injured we've had nobody get serious frostbite we've we've all been very lucky but we've also planned for it so we both have our thumb we all have our thumbs to say thumbs up which is which is what you want at the end of the day. Definitely. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sounds like some good risk management on your part mm -hmm. and preparedness, also adaptability, and great MacGyvering. So good for you. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> Keep those thumbs. <laughs> yeah. um, so in your job, it would be important to work with the northern communities who live, who live in the spaces where you do some of your research. Um, how do you ensure that their needs are respected and do they play a role in your field work? Yeah, so they're, you know, we're coming into their backyard, so to speak. They're, they're, you know, familiar with these, these lands. They've traveled on them, hunted and trapped on them, vacationed on them. They, they know it and they've been traveling it since they were children and their ancestors know, you know, the history and the climate. So we're, we're as, as involved as we can be in the community and in terms of, you know, talking to local elders and getting their stories and and hearing their experiences and sometimes it's just informal you meet somebody at the bar and you 
chat about what you do and in the past and sometimes it's a bit more formal through you know, community talks and engagements but everything that we we do at our research sites you know it is approved by all the different community groups and the hunters and trappers associations and the you know the the northern um, colleges and research institutes so we we follow all the proper um, administrative protocols that we have to too but we also try to involve um, you know the locals whether it's through visiting schools so every year a couple times a year I go into the, the, the northern schools and spend a day or a class or a couple hours you know chatting with the kids and showing photos and show and tell them this is what we do and if we get the chance we'll bring them outside or or ideally have them visit you know a nearby site that we have and say come on out like this is what we do and this is why we do it and this is how you might relate to it so we could always do that more um, but it is also very very time consuming and demanding but that's that's no excuse for not not doing it as, as much as we should so it's and it's a lot of fun too it, it uh, makes you think of science in a less formal way which personally I enjoy a little bit more it, it's great to see the smiles on kids faces even if they just want to you know go out there and dig a hole in the snow or <laughs> or or take a photo with a really cool toy or something like that it, that's always fun um, and then we also we we're involved with some of the local groups who who have guides that you can hire or um, or technicians that you can hire to, to come out and work with your groups and that's a big important part to a lot of the work we do because we don't live anywhere near our sites you know it's all the way across the country so to have somebody local who who you can rely on to go in and, and do stuff for you is is really key and uh, we, we've just started recently getting more into developing research programs with the communities involved. You know, we have certain expertise in a certain field, but maybe that can help you know, some of the local groups who are interested in, in something that may or may not be related. A big concern is fisheries and wildlife and, and uh, you know, us studying some of the streams and lakes and rivers, we can say, you know, maybe these lakes and rivers should not be fished for a while because the water quality is going down or, or the fish stocks are, are dying and it might be because of something totally unrelated but but they they all sort of relate so we're trying to get better at incorporating all the disciplinary or multidisciplinary fields of study to, to help out address local knowledge gaps that's really cool that you, you get to share your passion for STEAM there as well. And speaking of show and tell, we, that's foreshadowing, we're going to have a bit of a show and tell in this very chat <laughs> very shortly. But it also seems like a really great mutual learning experience as well, so that's cool. It is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we enjoy it a lot. I, I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. And anytime you get to go into a school and you know, either have some kid roll your eyes at one of your jokes or or, or put a smile on their face with telling them about how something works. It's a lot of fun. Sounds like it. All right, your next question is, what's one mistake that you've made that ended up turning into a great lesson? Hmm. I, so this is a, a, a little bit of a less, you know, field focused one, but I, when I was in, during my schooling, I kind of took some shortcuts a little bit that have now come to bite me in the butt um, by avoiding certain fields like math <laughs> and, and physics. And I really wish looking back that I had spent the time and challenged myself with, with those. Doing something that challenges yourself is, is definitely worthwhile and important. And that's sort of, I, you know, I learned a lot from that. I should have taken more courses that or challenging or, or that I wasn't as interested in um, to maybe expand my understanding of those fields and maybe I would have loved them who knows but because I didn't try I I don't know yeah that's a really yeah. good point, but it's never too late mm -hmm. and a good lesson to learn things that are challenging could be one fun but also super helpful to you in the future yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you might end up enjoying them as well. 
Okay, so Brandon, what do you do to help keep balance, de-stress, and chill out? I, I'm a, I'm a busybody. My wife says I can't stop doing stuff, which, which I love. It, it's great, but I feel like I always need to be doing something, um, whether it's you know working on a project or, or trying to solve a problem that you have or just doing hands-on stuff um, like you know handiwork around the house or building furniture or tinkering with some electronics that uh, hopefully give you some joy when you when you figure out how it works <laughs> so I I'm always doing something which doesn't really seem relaxing but to me it is that's that's I know that's how I de-stress I, I stay busy and and a lot of the times I'll do that through sports you know but I am a big fan of mountain biking rock climbing canoeing anything to get out and do something productive and enjoy the outdoors at the same time is sort of a a win so so that's that's my de-stressor is is to keep keep busy <laughs> I like that. That's really awesome. Yeah. Spending time outdoors, why not when we have such great outdoor yeah. space? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's typically more physically exhausting than anything. So when you come back from de-stressing, you're, you're <laughs> exhausted, but maybe that's part of it. Yeah, good sleep after a hard, hard day outside is, is maybe how I'm de-stressing. <laughs> And that helps me charge for the next day. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Your next question, which is your last career question, is what's one piece of advice that you would give to someone interested in your field in hydrology? I would say do something that you enjoy doing. You know, that, that's pretty broad, but if you if you're interested in earth sciences, you know start by taking a course somewhere or or doing some reading or watching some youtube videos or anything like that get yourself you know situated in an environment that lets you test it out and pursue it and i mean that's how i started i liked geography in high school so i'll go to school for geography and then i had no real understanding of what geography was because it's so broad and then I started digging more into earth science-based geography, which also has a lot of overlap with biology and ecology and geology. And then it just sort of like trickled down through the years. It's like, oh, I really like the courses where I get to go outside and play in the dirt or in the river. It's like, this is great. So maybe I should take courses more focused on those things. And then it just sort of narrowed down as I went through. So. I, but you, you have to do something that you enjoy doing too. I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I have a pretty atypical job that a lot of people can't or wouldn't handle. You know, like I spend sometimes a hundred days a year in a tent in the middle of nowhere. That's not for everybody. So y you have to find uh, a little bit of a niche that that fits you and you can do the same thing that I do but never visit the field and you can you know work with computers and build models and and work with the physics but but never actually have to go to the field site so you can still be a hydrologist and and not like rivers <laughs> and not you know know how to swim like like there's there's options out there for for everyone in in many different fields so I think you just have to find something you enjoy doing and uh, dedicate some time to becoming good at that activity and, and hopefully it fits you. And, and if you don't enjoy it, don't be afraid to change too. You know, there's nothing wrong with just deciding, maybe I don't like this anymore, maybe I should try this. And that's, that's totally fine. That's, that's acceptable, that's totally normal. Yeah. Hey, that's really great advice because it's such a nice thing to hear when you say that your work doesn't feel like work. It feels like fun. Mm -hmm. So 
that's something great for anyone to have. It's also awesome to hear the process of discovery as you went along. You didn't necessarily have an idea of what you were going to do in the end, but you discovered that as you went along. Yeah, I had I had no idea. <laughs> Which I think is many of us. So yeah. it's not it's normal. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with taking an extra year or, or taking some extra time to discover what you want to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's been a snowball learning about your career, Brandon. Um, but we want to know a little bit more about what it's like being a hydrologist with our next segment, Show and Tell. So do you have um, anything to show and tell for us today, Brandon? I do. So I'm going to start with my background here. Mm -hmm. So if, if I just scooch out of the way here. So this is a photo that I took a couple years ago on the Inuvik Tuktoyaktuk ice road. So this is a an ice road that's cleared and maintained that connects Tuktoyaktuk, a community located on the Arctic coast, to sort of the southern you know, access communities like Inuvik, and then further down into you know, the territories, and you know, connects the the communities to the rest of Canada. Um, so one of the things that I was fortunate to do in 2017, I think it was, is drive this highway for one of the last times because this spring was the last year that this highway was going to exist um, for a couple of reasons. One of them could be associated with a change in climate. So the temperatures warmed drastically even in the winter. And so if the winter temperatures are warm, the ice doesn't freeze as thick as it used to. And so the ice highway becomes less stable and it can't handle as many, you know, large transportation trucks. So, so that's one of the reasons. And the, the season of the highway was growing shorter because the spring was getting warmer faster and it would melt. And this is on a very large river, the Mackenzie River. So one of the largest, you know, the largest river in Canada. Um, and if, if things, if the seasons were shifting and changing, the highway is becoming less useful and less feasible. Um, so they actually built a gravel road from the community of Anubik to Taktiaktak, which is a big can of worms all on its own because there's many you know, climate and physical and hydrology, hydrological problems with that. But they discontinued the road here. So it's really, it was really neat to be able to drive it, experience it for one of the last uh, last seasons. So it kind of felt like an ice road trucker out there driving on the highway, um, which was really, really cool. And, and, and you get to see a very broad range of geographical features because you're driving on a Delta river. So you're just in this little narrow channel, but the surrounding area is pretty flat. And on the one side, it's a Delta. So there's just, you know, trees and lakes and rivers all interconnected. And then on the other side was just a large you know, remnant of an old glacier or glacier landforms. So, so on the one side, you just have this large hill here that sort of contains the delta from spreading out more. Um, but then as you move from the south, where you're still within the tree line to the north, you pass all the trees and you, you become above the tree line. And then it's just a big flat white expanse. And then eventually you're driving on the Arctic Ocean, which is really cool. So that was, that was a really cool experience to be able to drive that with a good group of friends for one of the last years that it was open. But that right. uh, other story was incredible. It must have been an incredible experience being driving on that road for one of the last seasons and then on the Arctic Ocean. Oh, that's that's wild. So incredible. Yeah, it was, it was a really cool experience. And there was, um, there was even a documentary crew who was doing a documentary on the last year of the road who came and stayed with us in camp for a day and talked about our research and how it might fit in with you know, the, the changes associated with the highway. And so that was a really cool experience to, to be involved with. Um, a second item I have here is a, a reindeer caribou antler from our research station. So this is a very small one. Typically they are, you know, <laughs> this <big. laughs> Um, but it's a really neat experience to be out visiting your field sites and hiking around and you just come across 
you know, these massive piles of, of reindeer antlers. And, and it's actually a neat story. So the research station I work at called Trail Valley Creek, the reason it's called Trail Valley is because there is a local um, domesticated reindeer caribou herd that actually a, you know, a local family sort of owns and manages and travels with and harvest but our research basin that we work in used to be the funnel for them migrating across the Mackenzie Delta and across the ice road in the back here so the reason we work at Trail Valley Creek is because it used to be the trail network for migrating these caribou so we find all these antlers out in the field as, as you're doing your work which is really cool so we have a large stockpile you could call it of, of these antlers in sight and if you weren't familiar with what they were it, it looks very eerie but uh, it's it's really cool to see and, and then eventually if, if you're lucky and you're out working in the winter sometimes you come across the herd you know, thousands or so of these caribou just out minding their own business hanging out and uh, it's, it's a really neat experience to be able to see that much wildlife because typically where we are in the tundra it's it's quite it's quite barren in a lot of places you you might go months or weeks without seeing any wildlife except a few birds so to, to see a large herd of thousands of caribou and and know that you know, there's a, a a tie to the local community uh, is really really interesting and, and to see maybe how our research affects the caribou because changing climates are affecting the wildlife migration patterns. And although these animals are herded, they still feel the changes of hot summers and rain in the winter and ice in the snowpack. So, so there's a lot of cool community ties through that. Wow, what an experience. I can just imagine it would be to just come across the herd or even just stumble across that pile of antlers that would be out of this world yeah that herd must have been so majestic to see especially given that the area is usually so barren, barren. <laughs> yeah that great must, thank you <laughs> that must be such an incredible incredible experience wow thanks yeah. for sharing it's a really cool experience and then I get to come home and and tell all my nieces and nephews and all the little kids that I was up working with Santa in the North Pole and I have I have reindeer antlers to prove it. Oh, that's amazing. That's adorable. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that story with us. That's awesome. Do they do they ask you to to bring up letters to Santa? Yeah, I'll usually send them a, a letter from up north too when I'm up there just to say, hey, I'm I'm too busy, but I'm up here working with Santa and his elves, or helping Santa move his his factories because it's sinking through the sea ice or something like that. Oh, well, that's just sweet. That's really <laughs> so cool. cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, I think we have actually just a bit of time to go to some audience questions before we wrap up. So we're going to grab the audience question box. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Ready for this, Brandon? I think so. <laughs> audience question box with All right. some comments. All right. First question um, is, where do you see your field going in the next five to ten years, especially with respect to research in northern climates? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really rapidly developing field because there's a realized importance now of how the north affects the rest of the world and the rest of the climate. So, And there's so many knowledge gaps, there's so many questions that are unanswered or interactions between things that are poorly understood so there's there's been a rapid surge of you know, increasing knowledge which is great but there's always a, you know a need for more so i think it's just gonna become more popular you could say um, but also the the way that the work is done is changing it's it's become less hands-on than it used to because we can monitor things remotely and we have 
satellites and things that can take measurements for us without actually visiting the field. So the field itself is changing towards more of a, um, I guess, it's becoming electronic. You know, I, I can do a lot of similar research in my office, on my computer, without ever having to go visit a field. But, but those require different skills. So you, having a, a good understanding of coding and you know, for multiple coding language is ideal, uh, which I think the future depends on because a lot of the climate modeling that our group might do, you know, it's, it's all coded, it's all computer-based programming. So having an understanding of that is, is really important. And then just understanding a lot of the technical side of things to improve you know, sensors and instruments and things that go into space um, are sort of the future, but that all depends on, you know, funding and, and politics too, which is sort of the, the side of things that nobody ever wants, none of us want to talk about because that's our biggest hurdle is, is, uh, getting support for the things that we want to do. Mm -hmm. And Hey, that's, it's kind of cool. One of the things you mentioned where you, you work with things like coding is a really important skill for this kind of field and you use everything from just a simple meter stick to something really expansive and expensive and mm -hmm. complex and that kind yeah. of leads to the next audience question ruby ann wants to know what's so we talked a little bit about tools what's the most important piece of equipment when you're working doing field work in the arctic personally i don't go anywhere without a multi-tool um, that's my most important you know, tool for, for sciences. Uh, and that's because a lot of the things that we have to fix or maintain, usually you have to MacGyver it, like I had mentioned before. And so having, having a tool to be able to do all of that stuff all in one is definitely key. For winter work, you gotta have good gear, or, you know, good equipment, the right equipment. So we wouldn't do any of the work we do now if we didn't have the right equipment for it. So we're not like early polar explorers where you just went out in your cotton button up jacket and like tried not to die through the winter. It's like you're wearing you know, top of the line down parkas and good toques and you know, the quality equipment that you need to stay alive and to keep all your fingers and toes, so. <laughs> right on. Definitely. Um, I like that. Being prepared, definitely. Um, and next question is, is this what you plan to do when you were in school? I think you kind of addressed this a little bit already. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely not what I had planned. I didn't even know this was an opportunity. Um, you know, I remember doing a career fair or a, a civics test and it's like, what's your career going to be? The answers are always like, banker, firefighter, or like police officer or something like that. You're like, wow, those don't sound that interesting to me. That's not what I want to do. <laughs> and I didn't know that you could get paid to go and, you know, hike around and, and measure stuff <laughs> or collect things and do stuff. I didn't, that, that wasn't even an, op you know, an option. So I had absolutely no idea what I, what I wanted to do until I tried a bunch of things that I thought sounded cool and found the ones I liked. Yeah, and now thanks to you, a lot of kids and youth out there are gonna know that being a hydrologist is an option and that you should check it out. So the last audience question comes from Chris. Thanks, Chris, for sending this in. Um, what do you like most about your career? It comes in a lot of different ways. The diversity of people that I work with, the groups that we collaborate with, the, the diversity in the you know, the day-to-day -day tasks that you're doing. You know, one day you'll be out sending emails, planning a trip and ordering food on bulk for a year. And the next day you're out snowmobiling for eight hours to get to a site. And the next day you're in a helicopter. The next day you're standing in a stream, filling up your water bottles with, with freezing cold water. Like it, it's different every day, but that, that keeps it fun. It's it's diverse and that's that's part of the fun, I think. I think that's what, keeps me intrigued is I'm I'm always on my toes doing something different. Exactly. Best part. You're learning while you're having a lot of fun, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. So our final question for you, Brandon, is what's next? 
I don't know. I hope I can just do this forever until my body doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> I, I really enjoy it, but it, it does take a large personal toll. You know, I, I travel a lot. I have to be away from family and friends for, you know, weeks or months on end. And you're, you're doing a very physically demanding job. So I like the hope that I can do it for as, as long as I can. What's next? I have I have absolutely no idea, but I'm looking forward to it because I think it's just going to be as fun as the last couple of years. Hopefully, fingers crossed. That's a great attitude. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hope you can do this as long as possible. And thank you very much for being here on the Steam League and joining us on the Steam League. And to everyone out there, you can see the rest of the superheroes of the Steam League on our YouTube channel and at steamsisters.ca. Thank you.